Thank you very much, Up. Thanks for the invitation. And I was asked to, to tell you about my experiences being the, the crisis manager, the flu commissioner for, for Belgium, and, and, and highlighting the communication uh, aspects there. These are some of my conflicts of interest over the past 20 years, I guess. Uh, it all started for me at that time, well, actually in 2006 when I was appointed. This is an unpaid hobby, so it's not a profession or a function, whatever. It's, it's really uh, a hobby, that, uh, that flu commissioner thing. Uh, on April 24, 2009, um, that was when um, WHO said, OK, there will be a pandemic, and that's when the, uh, the thing started. And then you have one opportunity to do it right. I mean, day one is so important. Uh, in day one, you start your communication with the press, with the people, and, uh, and you have to do it right. I mean, you have to go for one voice, one message. In Belgium, they chose to uh, appoint a non-politician to do that. I mean, I have no party affiliations, and that makes things a little bit, at that time at least, a little bit easier, because you're not, you're not attacked politically, majority, minority. Uh, that doesn't come into play, and that was a huge advantage. The second advantage is that you can play in Brussels the complete naive guy and, uh, and get a lot more done than you would otherwise be, uh, be able to do. So one voice, one message, that's the tone that you set on day one, and you have to be, um, you have to be very uh, transparent in that. Uh, my name is the Intermissive Commissary for Pandemic Influenza Preparedness Planning. That, of course, is too long. That became the flu commissary, and that was, uh, and that was uh, a, lot, uh, a lot easier. You have to be omnipresent that first day or the first days so that you attract the media attention. Uh, you, you make an agreement with them that you will tell them all, and if they call, you will pick up the phone. When you do that, then you can profit from these early days to, uh, to get complete carpet coverage of the field, and they're not going to search for alternative voices there. And if you do that, that makes things uh, a lot easier. And then you convey the message, and you can do that if you do it that way, that our country is ready for a pandemic. That is a gross uh, overestimation for sure. <laughs> but it, 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 it is crucial to, uh, to, um, to, um, well, to go into that pandemic. Uh, first of all, what's in a name? If you talk about the pandemic, it's quite important. People were talking about the swine flu, the pandemic H1 and 1. Uh, 09 virus, novel influenza, 2009 AH1N1 flu. At some point it was called the North American influenza, the novel flu virus. That was way too difficult, so we called it the Mexican flu. Yeah. That got me into huge trouble with the, uh, with the ambassador of Mexico at that time, and oh, she, was, she was furious. Afterwards, we became good friends. I still get invited to their, uh, to their New Year's reception every year. <laughs> but people were making fun of it, and, and okay, that's, that's probably unavoidable. But the fact to have a, a clear and recognizable name, which was easy for the lay public to, to understand and use, um, was, was actually quite important. It also worked. This is the word of the year of 2009. Uh, defriending on Facebook became number one. Uh, <laughs> to my big disappointment, Mexican flu was second and flu commissary was, was number six. So the term works, and that makes things a lot, uh, a lot easier. These first weeks, that's easy street. When you have no opposition and, and everybody needs news and they can come to you for news, you can bring quite a lot of neutral information and it is picked up and, uh, and it, is, it is, well, the news is brought the way you bring it and that is, uh, you can only do that in the, uh, the first couple of weeks or months. One of the problems that we have or that we had is that we did not have a media budget. That was really zero euros that we could spend. Uh, that means that you have to use every opportunity you can get to, uh, well, it's not Britannia rules the waves, but rule the airwaves to, uh, to bring out your, uh, your message. And that's, what, that's something that you can do for free on radio, on TV. Um, if you have good pre-existing relationships with the media, we, you can try something else. We tried uh, the, the following thing. We asked all of the anchors of the different TV stations, are you willing for free to participate in a, a sort of infomercial that you would pay for, all of you? <laughs> and they said, yes, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. And, and that was hugely influential. And, and well, we would never be able, nobody would ever be able to pay for something like this. But if you have pretty good pre-existing relationships with them, then, uh, then you, can, you can ask for a return favor and they will, uh, or they might do that. One of the things that we tried 
but it's 10 years ago, was using Facebook and, and Twitter, but, well, there were not enough people on Facebook and Twitter at that time to really have an impact. If we would do that now, that would be a prime channel to communicate. However, uh, that works both ways. I mean, also the fake news would be transmitted much more readily through Facebook, through Twitter, than, uh, than it did 10, uh, 10 years ago. Answering the question of the day, no matter what the, uh, the journalist's uh, question is, is quite important. So we had a call center which was gradually becoming more and more populated. And every almost hour to hour uh, and later day to day, uh, you have to get an idea what are the questions that the people are asking. <laughs> And, and every day, these questions were delivered multiple times so that you, I could work them in into the interviews no matter what the question was. Uh, the first questions, that was the first peak, uh, and that peak was about 900 calls uh, per day at the, uh, at the moment, uh, at the, uh, per week at the, uh, the first peak. The first questions were um, travel related. Can I still go to Mexico? Uh, I have planned a vacation, can I get my money back? If you solve that problem by declaring an emergency, you help quite a lot of people and that first peak uh, goes, uh, goes away. And then you have to predict the future. That's hard because the future has not happened yet. Predicting the past is a lot easier, but you have to predict the future in order to, um, to prepare the public and not have an over-exaggeration over, uh, or an exaggeration of the, the information in the press. So I said, okay, Belgium, small country, we will also have H1N1 cases. Yeah? When you bring that, it is front page news. When then, a couple of days later, the first H1N1 case arrives in the country, it is the second time that they have to bring that news, so they bring it in a more muted and I think appropriate way, but you can only do that when you prepare the, uh, the scene for that. That was the second wave of questions. People were asking more questions about what do I do when I get sick and so on. And that gives you the opportunity to, uh, to work with that. And then you have to say, okay, well, we will have H1N1 deaths. Of course, that would be unavoidable. Uh, I used there Sir Donaldson's uh, quote where he said that in the UK, by the peak of the epidemic, 40 people would die uh, per day uh, at the end of the summer. Uh, so. 62 at that time, million people in the UK, 40 deaths a day. I worked it out for Belgium. That would be seven deaths a day at the peak of the epidemic. I used that in the media. Seven Belgian flu uh, deaths per, uh, per day at the peak of the epidemic would be realistic. That is true in every year, even interpandemically. <laughs> That, that, that is very, very conservative. However, talking about fatalities is important because when you say that, people say, wow, what do you mean? People die because of influenza? And that was a necessary step to, uh, to take. And then, of course, a couple of days later, you had the first uh, H1N1 death in the country. And the scene was set and it was already talked about. That was the third peak of, uh, of questions where that were, well, the first that it had an impact and you have to, uh, have to deal uh, with that. I went to the first couple of funerals. You have to be very quiet, sit in the back, uh, but, but it, it, it shows that you care. And, and I think that was at that time quite important. So all in all, at that time, the overall feeling in the population, in the press was the Belgian approach is, uh, is reasonable. In fact, we wanted to be calm, cool, and collected. And our mantra was, and that was from day one, at this moment, it is comparable, uh, more or less, to seasonal influenza in terms of outcome. But we have to prepare for uh, severe scenarios. Like in 1918, the first wave was rather mild, and you could not predict that the second wave would, have a, uh, would carry high mortality. We focus on low-cost basic hygiene measures. We did not do any school closures. Uh, we used antivirals for high-risk groups. Actually, we used antivirals in the beginning for people who were ill. I had prepositioned cars in the different provinces, and they would drive antivirals to patients when they would be diagnosed by influenza in order to delay the onset of the epidemic, and that worked until the, uh, the end of the, uh, of the school year. We only purchased one dose of vaccine per person, and the, uh, the vaccination plan would be to vaccinate more or less the same high-risk groups as for seasonal influenza. And then the vacation came. And that is, communication-wise, a very dangerous period. It's a dangerous period because the uh, more untrained journalists are at the helm, 
Yeah? And you get the weirdest questions. They're understaffed, so more articles from other countries will come in and contaminate your message. And, uh, and that, that was a weird period. That was pictures that my father took from uh, the holiday with the grandchildren. And, uh, okay, yeah. I, I, was not, I was not the most social guy, uh, I, I must admit. And, and my son was born uh, two weeks before the pandemic struck, so that was not good timing. And then comes the time, inevitably, that they, they, they're going to talk about you. The flu commissioner is a really a great guy. And then you, then you get the feel-good articles yeah? about, yeah, what does he like, and what music does he like, pictures from my first laboratory when I was 13 years old. Uh, and it, it's all feel-good, but when they do that, they also sharpen the axes uh, at, the, uh, at the same time. And then, then your, your personal life, your, your personal life becomes uh, a little bit compromised and, uh, and so then they come to your home and you have to really limit that because if you do not limit that then, then you have no life. And then comes, then everything is said about the pandemic, about you and then the, the search for controversy. Uh, at a certain point in time, I had a controversy about the, the payment of the physicians for the mass vaccination that would happen in, uh, in a couple of months or a couple of weeks later. And, and then the quote that I gave them in terms of how much money they would receive that was far too low and I had to be fired. You can solve that quite easily. I said, okay, you want me to be fired. I would like to win the lottery. The odds of both of these things are happening are, uh, are fairly slim and that, uh, and that passed. And then you come to the, uh, the, the phase where they're going to be much more critical. And the first one was the government does not do enough. The H1N1 vaccine will arrive too late and there will not be enough vaccine. Get it while you can. That was the, that was the first, um, the first um, really atmosphere that was created. So not enough vaccine, get it while you can. So at that point I had to say, okay, I will be the last one to be vaccinated. I mean, you can all go in before me. Uh, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be the last, I'll be, I'll be the last one. And, uh, and that, uh, uh, later on I regretted that, uh, at that message. <laughs> That vaccination got campaign got a, a, a huge number of questions. That was actually the the uh, the crux of the uh, of the campaign was the the vaccination campaign, and many people had uh, had questions there. So you had to show them that you had. I mean, if, if the, the stockpiles, you had to walk there and walk in the uh, in the rooms where the where you could show them that we have the vaccines and there they are already in the country. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of reassurance was necessary there. And then you had to pick uh, who is going to be vaccinated first. Huh? And then, well, women and children first, whatever. I mean, risk groups, they were important. And then I misused the, uh, the fact that the, uh, the top, top football soccer clubs in Belgium um, inappropriately uh, and against all uh, agreements vaccinated their, uh, they made their soccer players priority people. So I said, I can use that because if the, the population really believes that this, this vaccine is so desirable that even the soccer players would be dishonest to get their vaccine. Uh, I, I said, okay, I can, I can play with that. So I made a big fuss about this. This is Van Ranst is, uh, is raving mad. Uh, <laughs> but, but it worked. And, uh, and actually these vaccination campaigns by the GPs went really, really well in a number of weeks. Everybody could be, uh, could be vaccinated. That's still a, a fairly relevant portion of the, uh, of the pandemic. Well, it, it worked fine in Flanders. Um, so you know Belgium, it's a complicated country. Um, and, and this is the, the vaccination coverage. And you could see Flanders did really well. Um, I, I, I did as many interviews in French than, than in Dutch. However, in, uh, in the Flemish part of the country, we listen to the Flemish media. Uh, in the French-speaking part of the country, they equally often listen to the uh, or watch the French television, where all kind of other messages were, were coming across, and that was uh, really polluting the, uh, the vaccination campaign in. And then, of course, people say, okay, the vaccine is unsafe, and then you, you get the, the swine flu hoax, and, uh, and uh, the vaccine could kill you, say no to the vaccine, that atmosphere starts. And then after the crisis, everybody becomes smart. Yeah. And you, you have to accept that from the, from the get-go. 
Uh, and then the overall statement was, no, well, the government did too much, of course, because uh, uh, the number of deaths were disappointing to some people. And then all the books are written, uh, and, and everybody uses all the data and forgets that you had to take the decisions based on a fragment of the data that were available um, or that would be available later on. And then it was turned into a scam. People were really making money out of it. And, uh, and I think the, the, the Council of Europe played a, a very bad role in this. Uh, this is Wolfgang Wodark, and I want to shame him actually, uh, because he, uh, in the Council of Europe, had a, a motion for a recommendation, fake pandemics, a threat for health. They basically said that all these, uh, all these virologists, vaccinologists, uh, they all have money in their pockets. They're, they're dishonest people. That's easy to say. This is when you Google for H1N1. Of course, there was a peak in October and November. You didn't hear Wodark at that time. When you Google Wodark, you see that it starts nicely after the end of the <laughs> pandemic. People become very brave at the end of the pandemic. I think that's, uh, that's not good. Then as time goes by, I still have one minute and 51 seconds. I would like to uh, actually issue a warning. Uh, this all started in well, April 2009, many years have passed. In fact, 3,560 days today, 508 weeks and almost 10 years have passed. And that has an impact because people are forgetting about the pandemics a little bit. This is when you look for influenza and pandemic in PubMed. Uh, until 2003, 2004, there wasn't much. Then H5N1 came and some interest was raised. Then the, uh, the 2009 pandemic arrived and there was a lot of interest and that is what happened since. So the interest is uh, scientifically is, uh, is going down. Also the leadership is changing. And this was a good exercise for a, a big pandemic. I agree, but when we're moving farther away from 2009, that experience is being lost. At that time, Margaret Chen, lead the WHO, Tom Frieden, CDC, uh, Suzanne Jakab, the ECDC, well, we're now one or two directors further, and that experience from 2009, there have of course been other experiences, but that one is not there anymore. The same for the leadership, the political leadership. At that time, Obama, Brown, Sarkozy in Belgium, Van Rompuy were there, and well, we're two or three uh, political leaders further down the road, and, uh, and a lot of what was learned in 2009 nine has been sort of unlearned and, uh, and would have to be invented all. Well, there is still Angela Merkel <laughs> yeah. and Apostelhaus. They're the, they're the mainstays. We, we can always count on them. Yeah. So are we ready for the, uh, for the next pandemic? I don't think we are. But I would say that pandemics are like a box of chocolates. Uh, and then I would like to invoke the words of the philosopher Forrest Gump. You, you never know what you're going to get. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Mark. Thank you very much. Any comments or questions? Yes. Hi, th thank you very much. Kieran Walsh is my name. I'm clinical director at the British Medical Journal. I suppose what's changed since, since 2009, we live in an era of fake news and social media. How will we get the messages across today? It is scary. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm really afraid of that because that was not around in 2009. People would still respect authority uh, that you got by by learning something or by professional experience. That is gone. Everybody has graduated from the University of Google and respect for, for knowledge is, is gone because why would you need knowledge when you can create knowledge by typing a couple of keywords in Google and getting it yourself? That is extremely dangerous. Also, the, the level of politicians that we have. Uh, I mean, I mean it, when I show these pictures, you, you know, except for maybe some exceptions, uh, you, you might want them back. Um, it, it, it is different. Uh, when I look at the US, and also Italy, uh, the anti-vaccination sentiments, they're, they're growing and they're growing also at the political level. That is very um, unsettling, yeah. Okay, any, any other questions? Yes, shout. I'm in my so what about engaging the, um, social, the, the influence like the entertainment industry? Um, that has been tried to a certain extent, also in 2009. I mean, you saw Barack Obama being vaccinated. We do that every year in the hospital. 
in the hospital, the director and the vice director in their underwear are vaccinated. <laughs> yeah? that, that has a huge impact. So influencers are, are important. Um, but you, you, well, you need the right influencers. I mean, the... Uh, the wrong ones, like the Kardashians. I, I, well, if, if they do the right things, they might not be the wrong ones. But, but I, I, I think they become unpredictable. They, come, they become unpredictable, I think. How the Emmys? With? The Emmys. The Emmy Awards. Eva but, well, that was not necessary. I, I think they meant well. I, I don't think the Emmy Awards ceremony necessarily is the setting to, uh, to do vaccinations. <laughs> but uh, but I, I think they meant well. I, I, saw, the, uh, I, I saw the footage. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, Caroline Brown, WHO Region Office for Europe. Mark, I really like your presentation, and, I, and I've seen it before, and it's still still entertaining. But it's only entertaining the first time. <laughs> okay, no, it's, it's still. But um, okay, so so Belgium called it the Mexican flu, as did many countries. It's it's a good name, but certainly from WHO perspective, we, we try to avoid implicating the countries. And I think that's part of preparedness. Let's be prepared for the next pandemic. What are we going to call it that we could all call it? Well, we, talk, we still talk about the Spanish flu, the Hong Kong flu, the Asian flu. And I've never felt that that was extremely uh, discriminating against, for example, the Spanish people. Um, I, I agree and I understand it. But the, the different names that were used were, they're okay to use in scientific journals. That is fine. Um, but to use that in communication with the public, it was over their head. Well, you talk about H1 and 1 and you lose 90% of the audience. Yeah, I, I understand, but I can assure you that our Spanish colleagues are still sensitive about 1918. Yeah, I, I, it's I, not WHO that determines the name. Yeah, so. The truth. <laughs> But I, I, I do understand the sensitivities. But don't you think people understand yeah. H1N1 now? Uh, well, a lot more people do than, than a couple of years ago, but never overestimate that, really. I mean, it is over their head. But H1N1 is seasonal today, so the Spanish flu is not seasonal, so... No, I know, but they're Yeah. To a certain extent. So you have mentioned your experience with Belgium. Do you believe similar experiences have been in other European or even no. non-European countries? I think it might be. Well, in Belgium this was possible, um, not because it's a great country, uh, but it's a small country. Yeah? If you want to do this, one voice, one message in a, a huge country, it is very difficult to achieve, I think. Uh, I think it's more important, or what, what worked more was the fact that uh, that I was apolitical. That I, I think that had more of an influence. If you do, if you have a career politician do that, from day one he gets attacked by the opposition, whose duty it is to oppose. Uh, but that um, it makes life fire very hard, I think, for them. Well, perhaps if you compare it to the Netherlands, which is quite similar, we had about 20 spokespeople. Yeah, and so that made it very difficult. Yeah, so. In Italy. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, it was 10 years ago. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, uh, Mark. I would like to revenir sur un mot. C'est la fameuse théorie du complot, là. C'est un complotiste. Qui est un complotiste S'il y a un an, on se parle ensemble, je dis, tu sais, Déborah, tu sais ce qui va se passer pour nous On va être obligé de se signer un papier pour sortir de chez soi. Eh bien, on va t'infliger une torture telle que tous les petits commerçants, tous les bars, toutes les brasseries vont mourir de faim. Tu vas dire, mais t'es un complotiste Complotiste, hein? Théorie du complot, brûlé, hein? Sur le bûcher, complotiste, hein? Théorie du complot, brûlé, Jean-Marie, ouais, sur le bûcher. Il ne faut pas porter de masque, c'est dangereux, tant dangereux. Trois semaines après, il faut porter un masque, c'est obligatoire. Quand un homme politique vient te dire que le conseil scientifique 
a décidé que c'est pas rien, c'est pas trois personnes, c'est une majorité de gens qui décident. Jean-Marie. Complotiste, hein? hein Théorie du complot, complot. brûlé, hein Sur le bûcher, complotiste, hein, hein Théorie du complot, complot. brûlé, Jean-Marie. Ouais, sur le bûcher, les décideurs, cette fois les décideurs. Il y en a deux sur 100 millions, mais c'est eux qui décident. Donc je te parle des décideurs. Ils obéissent à des contraintes. Ces gens-là sont aux ordres. Ils sont aux ordres du pognon. Jean-Marie, oui. vous avez une rage incroyable. Ouais, je suis enragé, on nous prend pour des cons. Complotiste, hein Théorie du complot, brûlé, hein Sur le bûcher, complotiste, hein Théorie du complot, complot brûlé Jean-Marie Ouais, sur le bûcher, 